John Donaldson and Rachel Stockley were married. And they were married in uh, the early uh, 1700s. As they started their life together and formed a family of 11 children. Of those 11 children, I'm the descendant of Stockley Donaldson, which was the son and brother-in-law of President Andrew Jackson. <clears throat> As we follow their trail uh, from, from Virginia over to North Carolina and then down through the Cumberland Gap, uh, Stockley Donaldson stopped off in Crab Orchard, Tennessee, and was considered to be the founding father of Crab Orchard. He uh, raised his family there and had a pretty uh, simple life, which is what he saw, uh, comparatively uh, to the rest of uh, the Donaldsons, especially uh, his father, John. His father, John, went on uh, to Fort Nashboro with the rest of the children and began to politic, began to work on things in community <clears throat> and trying to continue what he had done with the House of Burgesses in Virginia. And as he did, developed a fort uh, called Fort Nashboro and decided to rename it Nashville, Tennessee. And so his contributions, uh, as well as Stockley's and the rest of the Donaldson family, are realized uh, as you travel throughout not only Davidson County, uh, but the rest of Tennessee as well. And I think <clears throat> that one of the most important messages that came out of the Donaldson family is how to support uh, not only your family, but your city, your neighbors, your friends, your country, and to do it in a way that is inclusive, uh, to try to uh, build upon a village, a state, and a union. Uh, Andrew Jackson married into the Donaldson family and was supported uh, by his father-in-law, John Donaldson, and his brother-in-law, Stockley Donaldson, and the rest of the Donaldson family. But he wasn't supported uh, by anyone more than his wife, which was Rachel Donaldson. He decided to move uh, a little bit outside of Nashville and build a family-style uh, plantation. And it's called the Hermitage, and it's a great place to visit if you're ever in Tennessee. As this happened, uh, the War of 1812 uh, was fresh on his mind, <clears throat> where he claimed, he claimed uh, Louisiana by ending the war uh, in quite a polarizing fashion, uh, making him a national figure <clears throat> as far as military command. President Monroe asked him to uh, take that command and go down and sort of uh, bring Florida into the United States. And he did that. Um, he did it profoundly. And what happened with that was he again uh, gained respect amongst his troops and amongst the new citizens in the United States and was asked to go to Washington, D.C. to become president. And as he did, um, started to really take a look at politics. And you can see the evolution of the man in John Meacham's book uh, about President Jackson. And as you do, you see the uh, effects that the Revolutionary War uh, had on him. Uh, the effects that the love uh, given to him by Rachel Donaldson had on him, as well as uh, a value system I personally believe was instilled in him 
from John Donaldson's teaching. He became more uh, civic-minded, became more understanding of complex issues, and tried to address them in his presidency as best he could. Um, it's an amazing story to read uh, for the rise of the seventh president, Andrew Jackson, because he was a man who never intended, he never went to school. He wasn't formally educated. And if you look at his youth, uh, he was raised during the war with the British, uh, being orphaned at an early age and raised by soldiers. Uh, I'm sure that his experiences uh, were horrific uh, by the time that he ever even got to Tennessee. Uh, you're talking about a man who probably had already killed people on the path that he was on with the soldiers, uh, a person that was cheated of his youth, a person who certainly had to have some mental issues, uh, being able to contain all that resentment towards the British uh, and towards his uh, youth being stripped from him, uh, and being able to take that and apply it in life uh, through the military and become the President of the United States. Uh, the things that he overcame are amazing. When you take a look back to the Donaldsons through the presidency, his wife, Rachel Donaldson, died uh, as he was uh, crowned the president. And it was a very bitter campaign, and it took a large toll on all those who were around President Jackson. And uh, she was ill anyway and succumbed to life uh, a week or two before his presidency. And she eloquently asked Emily Donaldson to act on her behalf as First Lady for Old Hickory because she knew that there has to be some kind of a control mechanism when it comes to uh, Andrew Jackson. They went to Washington uh, and she is revered in Tennessee as one of the great women of the volunteer state. A perfect symbol, really, uh, because of her volunteering to be the First Lady uh, and dedicating her life to her uncle uh, and bringing all of that uh, Tennessee wisdom and Tennessee humbleness to the White House. There was a book written about uh, many Donaldson. Hers is one of the great books as well. And it's called Rachel Donaldson of Ten or Emily Donaldson of Tennessee. Uh, I think it's a great book for schools to have access for young ladies to read to see what can be achieved in life uh, when beckoned uh, or called to duty. As we all know, uh, Emily Donaldson's husband, which was Andrew Jackson Donaldson, became quite a polarizing figure himself as he was the first uh, chief of staff, as they sort of changed Washington with Jackson. And he became uh, quite the politician as he arrived back in Tennessee and was asked by Governor Sam Houston to participate in the Texas legislation and some of the issues that they were having uh, down around the Alamo and uh, other parts of Texas as we uh, sort of carved out the western side of the South. Uh, and it was being sort of brought in with those Irish values uh, that we find so much in the South into the uh, British parliamentary style government that the English were wanting to run. As you watched uh, the development or the bridges being built uh, between the Indian uh, the Irish and the English, as everybody tried to fit in to what was really uh, the birth of American democracy. Uh, we had carved the lines out and sort of forced uh, the British 
out of the Louisiana territory. Uh, we were trying to uh, maneuver ways to keep the sovereignty of the Indian nation by uh, creating uh, reserves, uh, reservations for them uh, to continue in their belief system. As the uh, Constitution and the Bill of Rights uh, were put together, and they were starting to form a new style of governing uh, called a democracy. And it was all spearheaded at that time uh, in the mid uh, 1700s. And the growth really began uh, when we got to the 1800s. Uh, we had clashes in theories about capitalism and democracy that culminated in civil wars, uh, Spanish-American wars, the Revolutionary Wars, and as you can see throughout the Donaldson's life, uh, there was major, major contributions made in politics, not only in Tennessee, uh, but in Washington, D.C. as well. <clears throat> I think that the De Democratic Party being developed by the Donaldsons and Andrew Jackson, uh, it's a significant uh, learning tool for us today. Because we find ourselves with the same divisions and the same issues uh, culminating from this uh, dictatorship type conservative, uh, you hate to say Puritan, uh, but it seems to be the same thing that the rebels left on uh, in the Nina, Pisa, and Santa Maria seeking a new life and a place where they could blossom on their own paths of freedom and liberty. Uh, when they came to this country. Uh, this country's been forged. Uh, there's been a lot of sacrifices made. There's been rights, there's been wrongs, there's been growth, and there's been embarrassing times uh, of our democracy that we don't address properly. And as I watch people in politics uh, like Governor DeSantis, and I see uh, some of the reports that come out and I call them reports because we need to know more. Uh, we can't just take one person's word for it. But when they talk about removing history books, <clears throat> especially when it comes to minorities, uh, it sort of peaks my eye out a little bit because I need for my child <clears throat> to understand the atrocious behavior of a delusional narcissist who believes that any race or any person is better than another. No book will move you more than the diary of Anne Frank. If you watch uh, the old episodes of the Waltons, where they depict so eloquently Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, path through a similar uh, type of atmospheres we face today. There's an episode where John Walton, the son, comes back from college, and the conservative uh, religious faction there in North Carolina on Walton's Mountain began to burn books because they thought uh, that they were evil books from Germany. And John Boy had to point out to them that they were about ready to burn a book that was called the Holy Bible, the Christian Bible, simply because they couldn't read German. That's how quickly ignorance uh, can fester and turn into something so disgusting as the takeover of the White House. When we see ignorance, we must address it. And that's the lesson that I learned from being uh, governed by Donald J. Trump. I had friends that I had known forever begin to speak upon white supremacy in a way that was so hideous and disgusting that one of my best friends told me uh, that Somehow it was justified that my brother and sister had died in an effort to whiten up the United States.
of America. I had never been hurt so deeply. Uh, we actually had a violent confrontation over it. I left. Uh, it's unexplainable. And so what I did was uh, I tried to leave all the foolishness of my life, including anything that I found uh, appealing about being social, and focused my efforts on the next generation of Americans so that they never have to watch these YouTube videos with their friends where they start talking about taking over the White House uh, before it ever even happens. And that's what these people did, uh, and they're the Ku Klux Klan. And they had a very specific agenda that was developed by people not educated enough to create a grocery list. As you could see, once they took the White House over, what were they doing? They didn't have a plan. They kicked their boots off, took their photos and pictures, uh, and then they were lost because they didn't have the foresight uh, to have a plan. And as we watched the CNN interviews with Vice President Pence, <clears throat> he let us know that Donald Trump had the plan. And he was on the way, as he told Vice President Pence to get out. And Vice President Pence said he felt fear, but he also felt a call of duty to his country not to leave. Because he was the last line of defense in this oppression and aggression that we've seen from Trump. 